have 10.01. So you know what, I'm going to just get started because we have preamble and um, that's not what people are here for. They want to talk forage samples. So I'm joking. They, they want to hear from us as well. So um, I will formally start our event right now, Forage Quality and Analysis. And I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, we're going to get started with the presentation and analysis very shortly. I'm going to start with a brief introduction. For those who don't know me, my name is Rachel Rusin, and I coordinate the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisor Program. This is an agricultural extension program in the Kootenai and Boundary region that is funded by the regional districts and Columbia Basin Trust. And that's three regional district areas, the Central Kootenai, East Kootenai, and Kootenai Boundary. I'd also like to acknowledge that today I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Sinaiaks and Sanaha, and I'm physically based in Rosalind. Also on the call today are my colleagues, Andrew Bennett, who's helping with technology, question and answers, and also our new general advisor, Danny Smart. She's based in Kimberly, and she's going to be getting to know producers and starting work as a general advisor. I mean, she's already started, but you'll be getting to know her a lot better in the near future. And today we're going to be hearing from Serena Black with the BC Forage Council and Mike Witt. He's a owner of Precision or Wit, he'll introduce himself. His own agricultural consulting company. He's a farmer and rancher in the Okanagan and he's also a director of the BC Forage Council. Um, I also wanted to give some context to this event today and a shout out to producers who been, we've been working with. Um, you know, this event today, it sort of sits close to home in my heart because Five years ago, Serena and I both started our positions, myself with the Farm Advisors and Serena with the BC Forage Council. And we've really been trying to figure out how to develop and deliver agricultural extension in a new landscape with different resources and are geographically dispersed areas. And we've both been experimenting with different things we can do and way to engage producers and to hear from you what you wanna hear. And we really appreciate everybody's time for letting us visit your farms, talk about your issues and being very kind to us as we figure out what we can do of value for you as farmers. Um, this event today has been a result of us working directly with you producers and trying to hear what information you want to increase your productivity and profitability on your farm. And it's not without tr troubleshooting on Serena and I's behalf. We have lots of calls behind the scenes to say, is, are we making meaningful changes? Are we actually helping? And I really want to reach out to Serena and, and really appreciate her time. Um, she's super dedicated. Everything comes from a, a space of really trying to do the right thing and deliver meaningful support. So thank you, Serena, for your dedication and working with us as we try to figure out agricultural extension in, in the 21st century in our remote regions with um, unique resources that we have access to. Um, I see Mike Malmberg is also on the call. I just can't see his beautiful face. And Mike's also been a terrific support through all of this. And Mike and Rick Teagard also helped collect a bunch of forward samples for this call today. So um, that's my sort of heartfelt shout out introduction here today, which I don't usually do, but I feel like this event today is a culmination of many years of trying to uh, quote unquote, figure it out. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Serena. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, and thank you everybody for joining in today. Uh, I really appreciate your introduction. Um, for those of you who may not have worked with me in the past, uh, as Rachel's mentioned, uh, my name is Serena Black and I am a manager and uh, for the BC Forage Council. And I also am currently coordinating a bunch of their research programming as well. So a lot of you have seen me over the past few years, uh, but uh, I was, uh, I'm based out of Prince George uh, technically. So go, having the opportunity to go down to the Kootenai boundary region, I would say was a pretty steep learning curve. Uh, just learning about that beautiful part of our province and the different conditions uh, and the vast different conditions that you guys experience there as compared to up in the interior, where the similarities are and where the differences are. 
So as Rachel kind of alluded to, uh, we've been working quite a bit together and the reason we're able to join in around this project, uh, this specific program around forage quality and the webinar itself is in thanks uh, to a part of our three-year research program that we are currently wrapping up, which was focused on demonstrating innovative pasture rejuvenation uh, practices in the Kootenai boundary. So part of that program, uh, we set up eight on-farm research demonstration trials, uh, allowing each producer to really think about what their goals were and try a different innovative technique to rejuvenate their fields. Part of that project is we did allocate some funding towards doing forage quality analysis, but just based on how those projects ended up being set up and designed, we didn't end up using as much of the budget specifically on forage quality as we thought. Uh, and one thing that really, as Rachel mentioned, that we learned over the years, the one big gap was really having an understanding of like the baseline of forage quality, what's impacting it and sharing that information with the producers throughout the region. So we worked with our funders and we were able to reallocate that budget line to be able to provide this specific program and this webinar uh, to really sink our teeth into uh, a topic that really does hit the bottom line for our livestock producers. We know winter feeding costs are one of the most variable costs that uh, you folks have. Uh, it really hits your bottom line. So understanding your forage quality and the feed out strategies obviously is, is fairly critical. So just very excited to be here today uh, and to be able to share the results of kind of what we've come to and then uh, be able to pick Mike's brain, uh, which I do on a very regular basis uh, to extract uh, the tremendous amount of knowledge and experience that he has. So just really excited to be here today uh, and to participate. So I'll leave it there because I know we wanted potentially to do a, a round robin with Rachel. Great, yeah. And so we're gonna hand the reins over to Mike Witt really quickly here so we can dive deep into the 72 forage analyses that we have to go over. Um, but we're gonna do a quick round table. Um, I'll shout out your name. You introduce yourself, tell us where you're based, what you're growing, and Mike, what did you want me to ask everybody again? <laughs> uh, just whether you uh, have beef cattle, uh, just sell hay, sell hay predominantly for horses, sheep, just a little bit of context for the presentation. Great. Thanks. And uh, so I'll shout out your name and thanks for doing this, everybody. It really gives the presenter a better sense of who's in the room so they can contextualize the presentation. Karen, I'll start with you. Oh, you got to unmute. Sorry. <laughs> yes, we have a beef cattle operation at Skookumchuck, just north of Kimberley. And we also run a small feedlot. Is there anything else? We grow uh, alfalfa grass mostly just for ourselves. Great. That's perfect. Thanks, Karen. And Alex. Hi, I'm uh, new to the game and we've got some sheep and basically just looking to uh, start a hay farm and uh, yeah, make forage for our sheep. And I'm just interested in learning about uh, different grasses and all that kind of stuff. So I'm a, I'm a total newbie to this. Great, thanks Alex. And he's based in Grand Forks. I am, um, yeah, based in Grand Forks. Great, and Pete Feldman. You got to unmute. Well, sometimes with the smartphones, you have to swipe left or what right. You know what? I'll go to Tim Measures while you uh, experiment with the mute thing. Tim? Or I can't see Tim there. Uh, how about Devin? You're doing your blinds. You'll have to race back. <laughs> yeah, I'm Devin Chersonoff from Grand Forks, uh, cow-calf beef operation, keeping a few backgrounders and feeding a little bit out. Great. Thanks, Devin. And Norm Duick. Hey, guys. I'm ready to uh, get ready to plant my field to alfalfa to start growing some Good quality hay. Uh, I'm actually from the central part of British Columbia, where Serena is. Great. Thanks so much, Norm, for joining us today. And for those who don't know Norm, he also works for ANL Laboratories. Is that correct? 
yeah, yes. and is great at soil um, analytics and helping with soil sample interpretation. So thanks for joining us today. And Eric. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Eric Mose from Little Fork Ranch, uh, Greenwood. Um, we do uh, beef cattle and some lambs. And I'm really interested in working with what we have in terms of our forage base, which isn't very good. And then just figuring out how to supplement it in the feeding season with uh, feed that we bring in. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Eric. And Pete Feldman, did you figure out the mute thing? Oh. Is it working now? It is, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm from Briscoe and uh, cow calf producer and I grow alfalfa grass. Fantastic, thanks for joining today. And Matt Kitchen. Hey, uh, Matt Kitchen. My wife and I have grassland grazers up in Beaverdale. Uh, cattle, sheep, custom grazing, uh, some grass finishing, mainly grazing, but here to, for what bit of hay we do buy, just understand the analysis on what we're buying better kind of thing. So thank you. Great, thanks Matt. And Rick, I see you pulled over for the intros. I did, thanks. Uh, Rick Taggart, Radium Hot Springs, cow-calf producer, trying to grow enough hay, never can. So very interested in this, thanks. Great, thanks Rick. And thanks Rick for helping gather some samples from the Columbia Valley area to get into this oh, project. You're more than welcome. Yeah. And Jordy Tebow. Hi, Jordy from just outside of Cranbrook, a couple minutes, uh, mixed forage uh, crops for uh, beef cattle and a small flock of sheep. And just want to learn more about reading these forage analysis. Great. Thanks so much, Jordy. And Del McNamara. We'll come back to you, Dale, if you're stepping away from your computer for a moment there. How about Maureen and Jamie Haynes? Uh, it's Maureen here. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Uh, so we're in Rock Creek. We have cow calves and we raise a lot of um, grain, uh, grain mixes for, for silage and there's some alfalfa as well. Great, thanks Maureen. And um, just for context, Marina and Jamie have also been picking up a lot of like spent mash from the distilleries and breweries as well. And I think they have one of those samples that they had sent in for analysis. So that's been kind of interesting, trying to diversify economically where they get some of their winter feed from. So thanks for joining today, Maureen. And mm -hmm. Patricia Logan. Hello. Hello, we can yeah, hear you. The Fall River area of the Stutney, and I'm producing certified organic hay for um, certified organic beef cattle. So I really have to produce everything I need from my own place. I can't buy off farm. So that is why I'm interested in producing the quality I need here. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining today, Patricia. And Patricia has been one of these uh, producers who's been poking at me for a few years, trying to get supports for forage quality analysis. So I'm glad that you've pu been pushing the subject, Patricia, and thanks for joining today. And Jillian Sanders. Hi, I'm up in the Meadow Creek area at North Kootenai Lake. I'm helping with uh, field restoration, so restoring some hay fields up here. And so just wanting to join in and learn more. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jillian. Jillian also runs the Grizzly Bear Electric Fencing Program in the Central Kootenai. So if anyone's in the Central Kootenai and needs support with electric fencing to keep bears off their property, she's the one. And Peter Tresher. Hello, uh, Peter Tresher. I have a cow-calf operation in Cisco. I grow some alfalfa grass hay and I have a small feedlot. Fantastic. Thanks so much for joining today, Peter. And Sasha Bentel. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Sasha Bentel. My husband and I run Cutter Ranch near Fort Steele. And we do um, pasture pork and beef and lamb. 
and we grow our own forage. And so, yeah, just looking forward to what we can learn here today. Thanks for joining today, Thank Sasha. Thank you for hosting me. And Trevor Han. Uh, good day, folks. Uh, Trevor Han, uh, following you from uh, Briscoe uh, this morning. And we, we um, are raising sheep uh, for, for meat and for fiber. Uh, so we're, we're really interested in high quality, uh, high quality wool. And uh, Scotland sheep are the, are the breed that we're producing um, or, or trying to, uh, to produce uh, for their high quality fiber, uh, as well as some other um, commercial kind of meat varieties. And uh, really just trying to grow enough feed to uh, sustain our herd and, and hopefully uh, have it grow uh, into the future. So really looking forward to figuring out what the analysis of, uh, of this, what I can take away from the analysis of feed and uh, produce more wool ultimately. Fantastic, thank you so much, Trevor. And David Munch. Hi. Um, we raise uh, uh, beef cattle for meat. Um, we also contract out and we do hay for export to Japan. So it'd be good if we could increase the quality on some of that that's getting exported just for returned revenues. We graze most of the beef on, on wetlands and other areas during the season. And then we just feed them over the winter and then put them back out on pasture early spring, depending on how wet it is. And this is in the Creston Valley for Lower Kootenai Band. Fantastic, thanks so much for joining today, David. And Thank you. last but not least is Tyler Morrison. Hi everybody, sorry I'm a little late. Uh, my name is Tyler. Morrison, we ranch on CNC Ranch straight at Wardner. We have a cow calf operation and we make some hay. So, just here to learn about uh, how to read the results. Great. Thanks so much, Tyler. And one thing that we don't have as part of our analysis today that's really interesting is Tyler and a few producers in the East Kootenai grow at the Creston Sprayfields Irrigation District. And it's a really unique project in the Cranbrook area where the city partners with ranchers to use their very high quality wastewater to irrigate hay fields. But, and it's really unique because those forage, forages are tested for every cut. It's like one of the most tested forage fields in our region anyways. And so it'll be neat to also look at those analyses after and take our learning. So thanks for coming today, Tyler. And Dale is unable to mute, he just texted me. So welcome Dale, Dale's in the Creston Valley and he grows beef, pigs, sheep, chickens, turkeys, you name it. Quite large and uh, farms about 700 acres of a variety of grasses and also grains. So thanks for joining today, Dale. Oh, look, he unmuted. Yeah, we switched computers. Uh, anyway, yes, we grow uh, beef cattle as well as uh, sheep and lambs for direct to consumers. Um, just looking today to try to do the best job I can with the forage that I do grow. Um, input costs aren't getting any less, so we need to give what it needs, not just a big pile of stuff. Thank you. Great. And um, if I missed anybody, please speak now. Um, the the Brady Bunch screen jumps around, so it can be confusing at times. So if I missed anybody, please uh, speak up. Um, you can also put it in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Mike, unless Serena, you have a little bit more intro that uh, you didn't get through. Uh, yeah, I think Mike uh, had asked me to kind of just do a broad overview of the uh, categories uh, and some of the results to jump in, and then oh, we can yeah. bring up these um, again later uh, if that would be of interest. So I'll start sharing my screen uh, and hopefully everybody can see it okay and that it uh, is now in full screen. Fantastic. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, um, we're here today about forage quality and that this is part of the uh, research project demonstrating innovative pasture rejuvenation practices. Uh, I do want to make sure that I can acknowledge 
all of the different partners that have made this possible. First and foremost, our eight uh, Purdue farm partners who have spent very generously amounts of their time and energy bringing me up to speed and working on this project. And the project itself was also funded in part by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the government of British Columbia through the programs delivered through Investment Agriculture Foundation. We had additional funding, um, a substantial amount of support and funding coming from the Kootenai Boundary Farm Advisors, as well as the Canadian Forage and Grassland Association. And then the BC Forage Council has also provided some funding. So what you guys are all here and interested in, um, Many of you who, uh, those of you who participated in actually being able to submit your samples uh, have received an updated version of uh, an overall summary of the results. You will notice that we have separated uh, the samples into various categories. So it's really important, uh, as Mike's going to go into, when you're thinking about forage quality and when you start comparison, that you really are comparing apples to apples. So we did. Um, separate these into the hay samples. We tried to separate into whether they were grass stands, a grass legume mix, or a legume leading stand, which we qualified as having about over 50% of the stand being in a legume. Uh, for we categorized any of our baled annual cereals as green feed. Uh, silage, we tried to separate out into alfalfa silage, annual crop silage, haylage or baleage, and uh, we had one sample of a warm season annual. So you'll see a, a one sample that was the sorghum sedan silage. And then we had a couple other uh, samples come in as well. So we, we separated out the straw samples. We had that one distiller's grain mash sample. And the one that's labeled standing grass was uh, standing, uh, standing grass that was harvested from a riparian area. So hopefully that kind of provides kind of an overview of the different categories that we separated in. Now in the sample that you, uh, in the overall comparison tables that you will see, um, you'll see that we've given participants a farmer code to keep your uh, information private uh, and uh, the sample ID. So this is, these are the two tools that if you wanna look at how your samples and how they compare to other people's samples, that's where you'll start. Uh, we added in some of that more information that you provided in the entry forms around the composition. So that goes into the grass legume versus a grass or a legume leading mix, um, as well as whether it's fertilized or irrigated. So in here, we didn't give you the actual details of what fertilizer was used, uh, but it kind of gives you a sense if you're wanting to compare yours to others, whether or not there's some of those management practices that are similar. And then uh, in the following columns, you'll see the different traits um, that you'll see listed in your forage analysis. So whether that's the relative feed quality, the RFQ, crude protein, um, and then we go off into the minerals as well. So when you start diving into those documents that uh, we shared around, that's hopefully this helps you kind of organize uh, how you can compare yours to other samples throughout that region. You'll also see at the bottom of these tables, we'll give you an average um, from the region itself, as well as outline the uh, lowest, the minimum um, number that was received, as well as the maximum. So hopefully this will give a, there's a lot of data <laughs> in here. So hopefully that will give you a starting place to kind of work through those tables. I know not everybody on the call was, uh, did participate in that component of this program. So as kind of an overview, I'm gonna go through a couple of tables just to kind of give you a sense of where the results are. And like I said, uh, after Mike goes through and analyzes, uh, gives you an overview of what these traits mean, we can come back to these tables later on in this webinar. When you're reading these tables, uh, the bar graphs themselves are showing you the averages. And then the error bars that are shown here are not actually a standard deviation or a standard error. They're actually representing the, the minimum and the maximum, the lowest and the highest values that we received for those samples. Uh, on any that you see that there isn't one, it's because we only received three or less of those samples. And so uh, it was really too close to put out there. So for a couple of these, I did look at, at across all of these categories. I did this for the relative feed quality as well as for the sugar content. So it kind of gives you a sense that you can expect 
different qualities and a different range as you go from uh, the different types of hay um, that you've bailed um, all the way through to uh, your green feed, your different silages, uh, as well as your straw as well. And in the, that there is variation. Uh, and I, I know Mike's gonna go into kind of what influences that variation. So overall though, I would say uh, these are some pretty, some pretty uh, good numbers. And, and again, Mike's gonna go into some specifics of, of how to compare them to what you're aiming for in your operation. Serena, can you just uh, touch on what the RFQ means? So yeah, the, the relative feed quality, it's a, it is based off of a calculation. I know Mike's gonna do a much more eloquent job of explaining exactly what goes into that. Uh, and, and there's two different values um, that will show up on your feed, uh, on your analysis. There's the uh, relative feed value and hope Mike makes this step in if I'm doing this wrong, because I'm still also learning uh, on the quality side of things. The relative feed value is actually a, uh, a composition that they've pulled off of specifically as comparing to alfalfa. The RFQ, the relative feed quality, is a newer calculation that they've come up with, which is a little bit more standardized and a little more up-to-date to kind of looking at various feed. So this is kind of when we were looking at a benchmark or looking at in the caribou we held a contest, we came back to the RFQ to kind of help us choose a winner. So it's, it's one of the, the main things that you'll be looking for as well. Great, thanks so much for the clarification. And just to reiterate for folks on the call, what you, this bar graph that you're looking at is based on the, sam the samples from 19 different farms collected in the Kootenai and Boundary. So we're looking at data from our region this year. And I just thought I'd drill that in Serena because sometimes yes. graphs just, you're like, <laughs> where does that from again? So it's interesting because these are the results from our region this year. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, it was actually 20 farms and we had over 70 samples is when I when I recalculated that out. So um, again, the, the majority of the samples that we received were in the hay category. So these first three columns um, and followed by quite a few of the silage, uh, then um, the green feed and then the straw. I think we only received three straw samples, for example. So a little bit smaller of a sample. But yes, all of this data is coming from the Kootenai Boundary region. So in this one, looking at the sugars, and this, we didn't touch base on this in the, in the past uh, fall webinar. So I, I would have to completely pass this over to understanding the sugar content and how that references to um, your, feed, your feed quality over to Mike. Um, but again, this is something that um, learning, learning is an experience, uh, an additional trait we made sure to uh, test for in this round with the Kootenai Boundary region. And again, just shows you not only uh, the difference between the different categories of looking at those sh that sugar content. Uh, sugar content also very, I know, very particular for horse people. Um, but you can see the differences in the, in the hay and the green feed compared to some of the silages and the straw. But you can also, again, see the variation if you look at these error bars. So even if you look at your, your hay when your glut grass legume mix, we had sugar levels dipping down towards just over three and um, uh, all the way up to 14. So there is a range in what the feed quality that you have. So making sure um, that's, it really just drills in the importance of getting these, uh, these tests done throughout. So I don't wanna to spend too much more time, again, because if you, we haven't gone through all of Mike's information. So a lot of these values might not mean a lot to you. So I'll go over these much too quickly for you guys to, uh, to really um, digest. Uh, so to speak, and then we can bring these graphs back up later on um, after the presentations to dive in a bit more. But again, I've organized these. So these four graphs are looking at your haze. So the blue bars are looking at the grass, the orange at the grass legume, and the gray looking at your legume leading stands. So in this top, uh, top left, you'll see looking at the crude protein levels and the differences between um, looking at your grasses and your legumes, you are seeing that higher average crude protein in your legume stands, but there are some samples that are still reaching those high protein, uh, high crude protein levels. So Mike's going to jump into kind of how those different factors can impact that crude protein uh, at, in your samples. Um, and along with that, making sure you understand your ADF 
TDN uh, and your NDFD48. Again, Mike's going to have to describe what all these mean for these to make, make much um, mean much to you guys. But look again, just looking at the variation uh, in those samples uh, in your net energy gains and your net energy maintenance. Um, seeing some maybe a little bit more stable averages, but still seeing those ranges. And then the bottom two graphs are diving into those mineral contents. So on the left here, these are all uh, minerals that are being shown as percentages. You'll notice that um, to try to make sure that we could see all of them, there's a couple that go off the graph. So some like uh, in this example, potassium over here with iron, you do see a substantial range um, of the different values that you are seeing um, with even within a single category. So again, just looking at how these levels can differ between the composition of the stands that you're working with, uh, as well as things like harvest um, and that sort of a thing. Uh, these minerals, the copper, iron, zinc, and manganese are shown in parts per million. So that's why they're separated out into two different graphs is that these axes are showing different numbers. So percentages versus parts per million. So that kind of gives you a sense of the hay samples. These are the silage samples that were, are, no, the, uh, sorry. These are the green feed samples, um, which is why you're not seeing um, additional bars. So just looking at the green feed samples themselves. Um, Sorry about that, that's probably really dizzying. Um, so again, just the main point here is uh, looking at that crude protein, the variation that you're seeing in those samples, um, as well as within those minerals. And then with uh, the different silages as well. So we didn't, there are reasons to pull apart the silages based on what crops you are in siling. So um, within those samples that we pulled apart, you can see that we the uh, typical alfalfa silage, um, the annual crop silage that people may have chopped and siloed, um, that um, I think is, is a growing interest. You're seeing it more and more. Haylage, um, for those of you who are able to just harvest at the best time, uh, when it makes sense, and then ensile them together. And then again, we have that one sample of the sorghum sedan, as well as a comparison. So you can kind of look Again, just seeing the differences that between these silages in the crude proteins, as well as within those samples. So obviously we're getting some, some protein levels up in the 25 percentage areas with the alfalfa, a little bit lower with those annual crops, but still looking pretty decent. Um, and again, same thing with the minerals. You're, you're kind of noticing with the potassium and iron in all of these, you're, you're seeing a pretty significant range um, in what you're, and the values that you're seeing in the samples themselves, uh, as, as well as with iron, very, very different. And even in zinc, um, with some of our halage, we're seeing some pretty big differences in the parts per million of our zinc. So again, the more information, the better. Um, these are the other samples, uh, just as kind of a reference. So the straw, for example, you're, you are seeing that lower, lower crude protein. Uh, the distiller's grain, I'm going to point that out specifically since that is um, a, a new thing that we're looking at. The protein levels are up above the 20% there. And then even the standing grass. So for those of you who are maybe grazing that riparian area, um, obviously one sample is not representative for the whole region, but something to, to kind of think of. So yeah, so I hope that this, I know it was a lot of information without necessarily knowing all the different pieces yet. So I'll stop it there and we can pass it over to Mike. Um, I'll put this up at the end, uh, actually, of looking at the BC Forage Council um, at the end of it. But yeah, just wanted, don't want to make sure that we give as much time as possible to Mike. Um, but hopefully that kind of gives a summary of your guys' results from your region and kind of the ranges that we are seeing. Um, yeah, so with that, I'll pass it over to Mike, and I'll let you introduce yourself as well, Mike. Okay, thanks, Serena. That was great to show the variability from this uh, uh, from this test. Let's try to get the screen sharing bit too. Okay, uh, well, my name is Mike. Uh, 
it's great to have uh, so many producers here and uh, you guys are quite fortunate. This is the third time we've done this presentation. So each time uh, we revise it a little bit and uh, ho hopefully make it better. Uh, there is a pile of information, so it's great that it's going to get recorded. So it'll be easier to, to go back to. Um, it, it's also great that you had a presentation on nutrition earlier so we can build off of that. Uh, a bit of my background, I'm a, a consulting agrologist here. Uh, in between in between Vernon and Lumbee is, is home base for me. And uh, my education, I went to University of Idaho and University of Saskatchewan and uh, mainly focused on forage agronomy and uh, and, and beef cattle. Uh, I've spent some time working in working in the feed business. But as I say now I'm self-employed, uh, working in uh, in those fields as well as uh, farming. We raise hay and uh, uh, some cereal crops and a fair bit of corn for grain. Um, I guess over about 600 acres at, at the moment, mostly leased. Uh, so lo lots of fun and uh, it gets a little hectic around here at times too. Uh, so we'll jump right in. Um, this is going to be, like I say, fairly, uh, fairly long. It'll, it'll probably go over. I broke it into four sections really. We'll have, a, we'll have a bit of an intro to forage quality. We'll break down um, a lot of what all those numbers mean and what their implications are uh, from a from a ration standpoint or from a beef cattle performance standpoint because that's most of my background uh sheep are, are relatively similar in, in most of that I know there's a lot of sheep producers um on the call I'll, I'll touch on the things that i i do know are different uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about influencing forage quality from an agronomic standpoint and lastly we'll talk about um kind of dealing with strategies in times when you're short feed or hay is really expensive, feed's really expensive, like we're experiencing this year. Um, we've got a little bit of economic stuff at the end if, if we get to it or some producers wanna talk about that later, we can, we can go there too. Okay, so part one, what is forage quality and why does this matter? Uh, anyone who's seen me present before, I love to say this, it depends. And it really depends on what you're doing, what you're feeding, and we have to match, uh, match the feed up to the need. Uh, requirements are quite a bit different, and we'll get into that as we go on uh, uh, differences between, say, dry cows and lactating cow and, and growing animals. Sometimes forage quality can be subjective too, right? Uh, many of you have sold hay to uh, to horse producers, for example, have, have certainly had that experience of, of subjectivity of color and smell and uh, various other things. And uh, we can't really reflect a lot of that in the in the forage test, but but it's important to some people. Forage provides required nutrients, energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins, and also adequate fiber or roughage for, for ruminants, which we'll be talking mostly about. It has to be free of anti-nutritional factors, toxicity from weeds, molds, or mycotoxins, or excesses, nitrates. Uh, we could have some mineral excesses uh, or, or other, other excesses, right? Other uh, toxic substances, uh, such as prussic acid and some annuals. Why does this matter? Uh, in my view, the most important thing is to be able to allocate the forages to the group with the, with the needs that best match up to your feed. Uh, optimize the use of any purchase supplements, better value traded forages if you're buying or selling. And from an agronomic standpoint, we also use it to compare management practices, uh, species and varieties um, with, within, uh, within grass or within alfalfa, within you know, even cereals and corn as well. So first step, everyone's done this, uh, identify a lot of hay, take a representative sample, numerous random cores. We like to see up, up to 20 if you have a small enough core to get that many without having a huge sample and use the proper technique and handling uh, 12 to 18 inches deep in the, in the middle of the bale, try to stay away from the edges and send it to the lab promptly. Don't take a silage sample and throw it on the dash of your truck because the results are not gonna be reflective of what, of what you have. Uh, it's key to have a, a good probe to do this, one that is sharp on the edges. Uh, I like to use a little bit of a bigger probe on uh, raft bales and quite a small probe for uh, uh, probably three eighths diameter on uh, dry hay because it forces me to take more samples and get a, uh, get a better representative sample. There can be a fair bit of variation uh, within your field and then that's reflected within bales. So we, we, yeah, we really need to get a good average here. Oh, you get your tests back. I usually fill up a, a medium Ziploc bag roughly, send it off, and we get some results back. 
oh, these look different. These are these are from some other labs. Uh, you know, every lab has its own way of laying out the results. So uh, that that's a key point. What you're looking for may be in a different spot on a different test result. Okay, interpreting and comparing results and their application to, to beef cattle requirements. Now, we'll start off here on the far right-hand side, I believe, of most of these results. It'll say whether the, uh, whether the results were done by NIR, wet chemistry, or whether they're a calculation. And it's important to, I guess, explain the, explain the differences between these. NIR is uh, relatively new, the last 20 years, I'd say. And uh, it's done by passing light waves through a sample and then comparing to a, uh, to a table of values based on what reflects back. And it's, it's very good for, for many things, forages, food quality. I, I believe this is how they do a lot of blood tests, even, even for humans. Uh, it's quick and economical, but there can be some variation. And some labs will, will tell you if, how confident they are in, uh, in the NIR values that they've given you. And this is also why it's very important that when you send a sample into a lab, you let the lab know whether it's an alfalfa or whether it's a cereal or whether it's a grass, because they need to know which, uh, which calibration to match up the data to, to make sure this is as accurate as possible. Wet chemistry is if you want to dive a little bit deeper, there's a number of different lab techniques using solvents and extractions. And uh, if, if you're, really into chemistry, you can go work in a forage lab and, and do these sort of things. Wasn't really my thing. Uh, it's slow and costly, but it is more accurate. Uh, quite often we use wet chemistry if we're looking at mineral levels, if we're formulating a mineral, or if something comes back and just doesn't really seem right in the NIR, we'll ask the lab to run an additional calculation or additional tests on wet chemistry. Usually the labs retain samples for uh, uh, for a few weeks after you send it in, in case you want to get a little bit more information. And then the, the last component is calculations. And uh, some things that we are concerned about on a feed test, we can't measure directly, such as energy and uh, that relative feed quality. So the scientists have come up with a way to, uh, to calculate the values. So really important is that we talk about dry matter compared to moisture. This will be up at the top on just about every feed sample I've seen. And then the samples will be split into, into two columns usually. There'll be an as-fed column and there'll be a, uh, a dry matter column or a dry basis column. Now, when we're ration balancing and comparing any samples, we always wanna look at the dry matter column. If we're making up a mix sheet for feeding, then we'll bring the moisture back into it. And the reason for this is we always want to compare ingredients on a strict, strictly on a dry basis. We don't really care what it weighs uh, in, the, in the field, right? We have to get that water out of it. And some feeds can vary in moisture. So this allows it to be adjusted easier for those moisture variations. The lab will determine this by oven drying the sample. I mean, you, you can do this at home as well. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, dry hay, we usually wanna see over 85% dry matter. Raft bales, bigger range, 40 to 60. Uh, silages, depending, cereal crops, 35 to 45. Uh, corn a little bit wetter. I, I put this little box at the bottom. It's what, this one's new, Serena. <laughs> uh, 25 pounds of dry matter of alfalfa grass mix. As dry hay, it's gonna weigh about 29 pounds as fed, as you're, as you're putting it in the mix wagon or putting it in front of the animals. Raft bales, you're gonna have about 45 pounds. And coming out of a bunker, let's call it 60 pounds there. It's, it's all providing 25 pounds of dry matter. So this is a pretty important concept, uh, depending on the type of feed you have. And remember that we're always building rations and building uh, feed requirements based on that dry amount. Okay, this is how you can check moisture at home. Uh, this is something that uh, I think we've I, I put out quite often, and uh, I even recommend it to people when you're when you're drying hay. If you don't quite trust your hay probe, uh, this this is a good way to do it. Take a sample, uh, take out about 200 grams, about half a pound, cut it up, throw it in your microwave, uh, preferably one that you have in the shop or the garage, not the one in the house, because it, it potentially catches fire 
and really smells bad, uh, throw in a glass of water with it to prevent over drying. First, first though, you want to weigh it, record the wet weight. Okay, then you microwave it for two minutes, weigh it again, and keep drying it for about 30 seconds to a minute at a time and weighing it each time. Uh, once the weight quits changing, you plug it into this formula and it'll give you your percent moisture. So we say it's a good way to check if, how wet your silage is or how wet your feed is, or if, or if you're drying down hay and you just want a confirmation uh, that you're getting close. It definitely, uh, uh, I burned up a couple microwaves doing this. So some microwaves don't like being run on high a lot. So sometimes you need to give it a bit of a break to, to cool down if you're drying really wet samples. Now, when we're looking at a feed result, think of the results like a pie. We'll break them up into five main categories, structural carbohydrates, non-structural carbohydrates, protein, fats, and ash. And if we relate this to what a, what a livestock's require, what a cow's requirements are, uh, fiber comes predominantly from the structural carbs, protein is protein. We're gonna find the minerals in the ash component. We're gonna find energy, all over the place from fat to protein to within non-structural and structural carbs. And, and I had to mention water as well, because that's another requirement for cattle that we're not necessarily gonna see on the feed result. Now, you've probably seen this in lots of different presentations about fertilizer. It applies to, uh, to animals just as much, uh, the law of the minimum. And, uh, it's, it doesn't matter if you have way more protein than you need or way more minerals than you need. If your energy is lacking, it's going to limit your, your performance of those animals. Uh, similar to, to on a field, if you're short one particular nutrient, it's, it doesn't matter if you have a whole bunch extra nitrogen. If you're short phosphorus, that's going to be your limiting nutrient. Applies to, to both plants and animals. So we'll jump into protein. It's uh, what everyone jumps to, I think, on the feed tests off the bat. And it's measured just as nitrogen in the sample times 6.25%. Now, animals actually have a requirement for amino acids. And uh, we'll talk about that in, in terms of protein quality, in terms of uh, uh, animals need more of some amino acids and, and less of others. And different feeds have different uh, provide amino acids in different levels, have different qualities of protein. More important, say from a dairy nutrition standpoint than from a, a beef standpoint. But if you're feeding some byproducts or some, uh, some annuals, this can come into play because the numbers are a, little, are a little bit different. And most ration software or nutritionists end up using computer models to calculate metabolizable protein. Uh, we'll talk mostly just about crude protein because that's, uh, that's a more, I, I would say, basic concept and easier to understand. We, we don't need to have a computer model telling us exactly how much protein the animal's getting. Protein is broken out into soluble protein and, uh, and bypass or undegradable protein. We use a soluble protein to feed the rumen bacteria. Uh, they create their own protein when they die off and pass down the digestive tract of the animal. And this is important because they're designed specifically to be the perfect balance of amino acids, the highest quality protein possible for that animal. This process requires energy. Now on a feed test, it'll be reflected uh, as your soluble protein number. Typically on hay, we're gonna see that number be somewhere between 30 and 55%. Silage is always a little bit higher. 40 to 60 percent and and haylage bales they'll lump in with silage on this bypass protein is absorbed directly into the small intestine we're not going to worry about that too much uh more of a, a high i'd say high production dairy thing as well one thing that is important to talk about though is bound protein this is on a feed test is reflected as uh, adf cp or adicp it's protein that's been heat damaged and is unavailable. Uh, you'll see it in, in the bales as being kind of caramelized, like that, that photo to the right has kind of that, that uh, sweet molasses smell to it a little bit when it's just cooked a little bit. The animals, I, I mean, they love it, right? They'll, they'll go after that. But if it's over 10% of crude protein on the test, we actually have to adjust the crude protein number downward because some of that protein is unavailable. Uh, 
I'll pick on this. This, this is one of my own hay samples that we're getting pushed by the weather and bailed it a little bit too wet. And uh, yeah, the big square bales heated up in the middle. If you're deficient in protein, wh why does this matter, right? Why are we looking at this? You can have reduced growth rate, weight loss, reduced intake, um, delayed cycling. There can be there can be some impacts on on unborn calves, some uh, uh, imprinting. If we have excess protein, loose manure, uh, excess insoluble, can have issues with uh, uh, reproductive issues. If it's really excessive, there is an energy cost to, for the animal to deal with that excess soluble, and there can be some nutrient management impacts uh, that come along with that as well. Okay, this is a this is a page of uh, of requirements. I it should show up properly on everyone's screen. I hope. Uh, can you see the delineations of which color is at the bottom? Okay, excellent. I had that at the top before and then Zoom got in the way of it. So I moved it down. <laughs> uh, as you can see, protein requirements go up for cattle. The top, the three on the left are mature cows and growing heifers in, in purple and uh, kind of orange go up uh, during, the, during the year from mid-pregnancy towards calving and uh, heifers are higher than than mature cows. I want to reflect that because they're still growing. Uh, for growing animals, that would be on the right-hand side, uh, 500 pound steer and 900 pound yearling or the red and, and orange in that case. And uh, as you see, requirements go up substantially as you want to increase performance or increase gains. And uh, just a rough comparison, these lines show some let's just say average values for some common for some common feeds right so you can see that if you have a straight grass harvested late there's potential to be deficient for, at a lot of different stages within the uh, uh for, for both cows and for growing animals and uh cereal silage as well we can be deficient in protein uh, that's why i really like alfalfa grass mixes and it was it was good to hear that a lot of producers here are already using mixes uh, also you can see straw we're way down there five, six percent protein. Okay, a little bit of plant biology. So to, to better explain, I hope uh, hope the rest of it. So under a microscope, this is a rough approximation of what a cell would look like. We have uh, the, the green part of the middle is everything within the cell, cell contents. And that's where we find the proteins, sugar, starch, fat, everything in there is high energy, rapidly available, uh, and, and, and good for the animal, we'll put it that way. And uh, as you move out from the inside of the plant, the blue area is hemicellulose. There's a layer of lignin, that there would be the black line between the blue and the orange, and the outer edge would be the cellulose. And that makes up the cell wall, everything that helps hold a plant up, uh, hold its shape. And uh, this is important because we'll get a little bit further into what into how the numbers play into this as we go along. But hemicellulose is relatively available. Lignin is pretty much not available, and cellulose can be available. And the way lignin is attached, I mean, my my diagram here doesn't reflect it very well, but the lignin kind of zigzags along and branches out and has all these different linkages within there that uh, that change how it bonds and changes how available. Uh, that energy is to the animal. So I managed to find these images online from uh, looks like Berkshire, Berkshire College um, back east. And this is a uh, this is an alfalfa stem. And I think it's really neat because it's sliced really thin under a microscope. And the cells that you can see on the on the lower part of the screen that are more of a red color, they're they're what's called uh, sclerenchyma cells. And you can see that the cell wall on those is is really thick, and it's actually it's actually dyed off. That's why it's red in these in these little dyed cell swipes. And you see they have they have a lot of lignin and a lot of cell wall to help hold the plant up, as compared to uh, closer to to the edge at the upper right hand corner. You'd have your your epidermis is the outside edge there, and then just in behind that are a lot of the cells that have uh, you know chlorophyll functions and to give it that green color. And you can see they're mostly cell contents. They're mostly uh, they'll full in the middle and not as thick on the outside edges. So I thought that was kind of a neat reflection. Uh, 
here's a, here's another example. This is a corn leaf uh, that's been sliced really thin, and you can see the uh, the stomata or those little gateways coming in, and uh, the little bundles in the middle are um, uh, how the plant moves nutrients and water within itself, and you can see quite large cells. It's hard hard to point on here. I figured out a pointer, but that's okay. Um, you can see, there's lots of there's lots of variation in the cells. I guess is what I really want to get at here, uh, from how thick the cell wall is to how many cell contents there are, and that's reflected a lot on the feed test when we get into it. So, two main ways we talk about structural carbohydrates are NDF and ADF, and as I mentioned briefly, lignin cellulose and hemicellulose are found in the cell wall. They're the structure. NDF is all three of those put together, and we use that for predicting intake and rumen fill. ADF is the lignin and the cellulose. They're least digestible, and we use those for predicting energy. Now, lignin can also be identified on the test on its own, and sometimes that's neat to see as well, uh, but we don't use that as, as much anymore. Typical ranges, you can see there's huge ranges. NDF, 35 all the way up to 70. ADF can be usually between 30 and 40. Lignin between four and 8%. And we really care about the fiber, both because we can predict intake and energy from it, but also because it's important to maintain that effective fiber level for rumination and, and saliva production for that animal to function properly. We'd be remiss without talking about feed intake a little bit because of the way it's uh, reflected here, related to capacity of the digestive tract, animal size, size, uh, class, stage of production, somewhere between one and a half and three and a half percent of body weight. But it's really driven by forage quality. It's driven by that NDF number and NDFD, which is fiber digestibility. We'll get to that a little bit more as well. Other influences, of course, though, temperature, moisture, anti-nutritional factors, right? If fermentation's off or, or there's some, uh, some weeds in there. So on the feed test, you'll see NDF portrayed as ANDF. And ANDF and NDF, we can use them almost interchangeably. ANDF, is, it's a modern version that reflects it a little bit better. Uh, we won't get into the, to the exact reasons why, but let's, it's better, so we're going to use it. It's used to mainly predict forage or predict feed intake. Animals are able to consume a set amount of fiber. And... Um, I guess this goes into a little bit of calculus in my graph here, but the area within those orange boxes is the same. So if you have an early alfalfa with say an NDF of 40, your intake is probably going to be around 3% of body weight. If you have a mature alfalfa and NDF is say 57, 58, intake is going to go down to say 2%. If you have a straw, NDF is going to be oh, up around 70 most likely. So intakes are only gonna be around 1.8%, right? So that's, that's one use for that number for us. It's greatly influenced by maturity. Now grasses usually have five to 10% higher NDF and they break the rules of my graph here a little bit because that, that portion of NDF is mostly hemicellulose and depending on their digestibility, it's, it can be available, which is why we have the next number on the feed test, the NDFD or ANDFD. And this is the fiber digestibility. It influences intake and it's influenced by the species, the environment, the variety. Um, agronomists use this sometimes to, to compare which, uh, which genetics to advance, to commercialize. Now, it can get really confusing because different labs and different tests will break this out into a number of different time periods from 12 hours out to 240 hours. Uh, you have to be careful not to compare these numbers between, between different time periods. If you're comparing, you have two tests side by side, just make sure you're looking at, they both say 48 or they both say 240. Don't compare the 30 to the 48 number necessarily. Uh, these results mostly have, I think they have 30 and 48. So we'll, we'll use the 48 numbers. They're a fairly common number to compare, to just look at the general digestibility of a, uh, of a forage test. Grass, as I said, it's higher than alfalfa, right? 40 up to 65%. Grass or alfalfa, 40 to 55. Straw, quite indigestible, right? 30 to 40%. Corn or cereal silage or mid-range, 55 to 60. 
some tests you may also see UNDFD. This is another way of, uh, of portraying lignin or other undigestible uh, products. The other carbohydrates found within the plant, we'll talk about what's, what's in the cell wall now, uh, is non-structural carbs. It includes starch and sugar. Now, on the feed test, you'll find it portrayed as NSC usually, um, or broken out as sugar. A number of different labs for, say they portray this different ways and nutritionists, whether you're using it for dairy, you want to see different numbers here compared to horses. So it, it yeah, there's, there's a lot going on, but I tried to cover most of it here. Okay, starch found in the grain within, within corn silage, within cereal silage, you'll find a small amount with imm immature grasses, 3%, 5%, usually you won't see more than that in there. Uh, sugars, often high in cool season perennials, uh, portrayed either as water soluble carbs or ethanol soluble carbs, depending on the lab and kind of where they're looking, looking to use it. Uh, water soluble carbs is usually simple sugars plus fructin, which is a more, a more complex sugar. Uh, yeah, ethanol soluble is usually just the simple sugars. Uh, quite often for horse hay, we're concerned with the, with the water soluble carbs plus starch um, being, being under 10 if they're uh, sugar intolerant horses. Uh, generally from a ruminant nutrition standpoint, higher sugar is better. This is gonna give us more energy, uh, better performance out of, out of that forage. Even if it has lower fiber digestibility, it can be made up by higher sugars. It's also very easy to, to lose the sugars and we'll get into that more during, uh, uh, during the influencing forage quality part. There is one other sugar and, and it's pectin. I'm sure anyone who's made, who's made jam knows about pectin. It's actually found in the cell wall. Uh, alfalfa is really high in pectin and, and other legumes. It's not something within grass. Now, the reason we mention that is because it doesn't show up in the NSC number, but it would show up within the NFC number or within a pectin number if that's delineated separate on the test. Like I say, lots going on in sugars can be, can be confusing. Uh, some people like to use NFC. I don't use it that much because it is a calculated value by subtraction. The lab takes all the other, uh, all the other numbers from the test result and whatever's left over, they put into NFC. So if there's any error in anything else, it's going to throw the error into the NFC number as well. So quite often we don't use that. We don't use that as much just because there can be potential for error. Now, we talked about protein. Now, the other really big thing that animals need is energy. And it's what a lot of this discussion about digestibilities and sugars ties into because they're used to, a, to quite a large extent within these calculated values for energy. And the two main ones we use are TDN and net energy. TDN, total digestible nutrients. Traditionally, this was calculated straight from an ADF number. Uh, the lower the ADF, the higher the TDN was. Now labs use a new formula that includes uh, NDF digestibility, uh, the, the fiber portion itself of NDF, and, uh, and removes, removes the ash a little bit better than just using, the, just using ADF. So they can be more accurate, but there can be some risk depending if you have, if you have samples from two different labs side by side, the TDN numbers might not jive quite as well. It's good to have, good to be comparing TDN directly between one lab to uh, directly between the same lab. Net energy is, uh, is another way to look at it. Uh, it's broken out into maintenance, gain, or lactation. We're mainly concerned with maintenance or gain, and it's an energy density. It's, it's measured in uh, megacalories per pound or per kilogram. And uh, we have an understanding from uh, these calculated values and tables that uh, the universities have given us that of, of how many calories are required for that animal's, uh, animal's energy, energy needs. So we can, uh, we can relate this back, usually with the help of software, because this can get a little bit math intensive to, uh, uh, to see if we're meeting those, those net energy needs or not. Uh, as intake goes up or down, you know, if, if they eat more, they're getting more energy out of, uh, uh, more energy out of the feed because, you know, there's just more calories going in there, right? 
Now, carbohydrates contribute to energy. They're either rapidly available or slowly available, as I mentioned uh, previously, non-structural or uh, uh, digestible fiber falling into those categories. Just a, a brief reflection of what energy needs look like uh, over, over the year for this, this would be for a, uh, say a 1300 pound cow calving in, in March with weaning in October. You know, they're lowest in the fall increase up to and, uh, and after calving and uh, how that reflects roughly to uh, left-hand column is how many mega calories of energy that animal would need. And right hand is roughly what a TDN equivalent to that would be from a forage standpoint. So you can see there's, there's times of year where you can get by with quite a low quality forage at 50 TDN or lower, low energy forage. And there's times of year where, where we really need a high energy forage or they're gonna lose condition. It's on, on the condition direction, it takes a pile of energy to put condition back onto animals. So on this graph, if you are a, uh, a borderline animal, that would be say one body condition score on the, uh, uh, on the nine point system or half a body condition score on the five point system off of ideal. It takes about 20% more energy to put that, that condition score back on in 120 days. Uh, if, if you're thin, that would be, uh, you know, a, a whole body condition score on the five point or, or two on the other one, uh, that's going to take about 30% more energy to put back on in a 120 day period. So you see that that's a huge additional requirement. Also low, uh, low temperature greatly affects energy needs as we found out here a couple of weeks ago when we were quite cold. So animals have what's called a lower critical temperature and depending how acclimated they are and uh, their cleanliness, hair depth, wind speed, it's somewhere between minus 10 and minus 25. If you're 10 degrees under that, say you're minus 20 and they're not acclimated or you're minus 30 plus, uh, it's going to take up to 20% more energy to look at, to, to meet those needs. And the other important part here is that we need to consider their increased intake needs as their metabolic rate increases from the cold temperature. They're able to eat a lot more. And that can be reflected with some of the data that we get off of these forage tests as well. Similar graph to the last one, uh, energy requirements for growing heifers are, are higher than cattle. Uh, and, as, and same kind of thing, as you go from half a pound of gain up to two and a half pounds of gain, your energy needs go up exponentially. And once again, here, I, I put some common forage values on here, right? Late harvest compared to early harvest, this would be perennial forages. And they had kind of where corn silage would fall in or, or other supplements, just straw or, or rolled barley, just as a, a general reflection. Uh, if you're short energy, no loss of body weight, poor conception, declining growth of milk. Uh, we have some different solutions. We'll, we'll get to those later, right? Whether it be supplements or or use your forage test to, to look at a different, uh, a different forage or better allocating the ones you have. We talked about TDN a little bit and how it has different calculations. This is the big one that Serena mentioned earlier, RFQ, relative forage quality. Uh, we don't use it to develop the ration, but strictly for comparison purposes. It has a typical range of 80 to 200. 100 is equal to full bloom alfalfa. So these, these are kind of my numbers that I put in here. Um, if you're over 150, I would consider that premium. 120 to 150, good to very good. Uh, 90 to 120, fair, below 90. It was generally what we consider a, a poor quality forage. Uh, some results, particularly corn, you may see milk per ton used. And uh, that's really useful when we're using yield data in combination with it to calculate a milk per acre. Uh, it's, it's not really milk, but it's, it's just another one of these comparative things that we can use to compare between, uh, between varieties and production practices. Uh, you'll find ash on a feed test as well. It's everything left after the lab burns the sample. It includes your minerals. High levels can be an indication of dirt in the forage. So if you've got a, a pile of, uh, a pile of gophers and <laughs> all kinds of ground squirrels and stuff like some farms around here do, that number can get pretty high. 
you know, I've seen it up to say 16, 18% at times. Uh, generally for alfalfa grass perennials, we're gonna between, be between seven and 9%. If you're over 10, it's potentially contaminated with some soil. Uh, now, we mentioned before minerals. We like to see wet chemistry done on these if possible, because it's a little bit more accurate. Uh, and this is a little bit of a cautionary note, looking at mineral levels from a feed test and you know, say, say you're troubleshooting some problems within your herd, some mineral issues are best determined in conjunction with other tests, whether it be water or soil, blood, liver biopsies, manure. Uh, if, if, yeah, if you're troubleshooting a problem, you need more information than just the feed test or conversely, the same happens, right? I feel that uh, if you're doing blood tests, you really should be doing a forage test as well to look at these minerals so that you have data from both. Key point with minerals, as Serena showed earlier on, there's a high variability of mineral levels due to location and crop, uh, probably within even within field too. So important to get that representative sample. We'll talk a little bit about the specific minerals. Uh, hopefully this will be review for, for a lot. Uh, calcium, important for milk production and bone growth. Deficiency gives you milk fever. Uh, the ratio of calcium is important to phosphorus. So somewhere between one and a half to one and three to one is where we like to be. Uh, calcium is important, especially as you look at crops outside of, uh, outside of alfalfa dominant crops, right? Animals have a, have a need for this calcium, right? We'd like to be somewhere up near 1% or, or in that range on the ration. And a number of forages don't necessarily provide that on their own, particularly straight grass or cereal crops. And if you look on the right-hand side there, I, I just put some average ranges, calcium one, to 2% on alfalfa. Grass, you can see we're generally under 1%, can get pretty close to zero. Grain is, is even lower yet, barley, corn. Uh, that, that is strictly grain. That, that wouldn't be like a cereal silage. That's actually the grain. Uh, phosphorus, extremely important for reproduction and growth. Also a very common deficiency in forages. Uh, 1974, there was a BC study done, I, I believe in the caribou, I have, have to look up the results exactly. Uh, the farm was quite deficient in phosphorus and supplementing a phosphorus mineral. They increased their calf crop from 79% to 97% and added 20 pounds to weaning weight. So that, that's a pretty big gain from mineral supplementation on a, on a field that was deficient or on a, on a farm that was deficient. Uh, they also may have been able to get similar results by having a forage that would have been higher in, in phosphorus uh, available to those animals. Alfalfa and grass are generally similar in phosphorus levels, 0.1 to 0.3. Grains are higher, a quarter to half. Salt, animals will actively seek it out. It's, it's on the test as uh, both sodium and chloride, chloride, I think, are on there, Na and Cl. Uh, we don't worry about it so much on, on the forage test. It's just one of those things that's normally on there. Uh, salt's important because we can use it to increase our limit intake. Magnesium is, is an important thing on the feed test though, because deficiency can cause grass or winter tetany. Uh, we've seen grass tetany over here a few times. Uh, typically when you turn out onto a lush pasture and um, on land that's say higher, higher pH, high potassium, high calcium, but low magnesium. And we use what's called a tetany ratio. I, I didn't put it in here uh, where we, where we plug a lot of those numbers into and help determine how much of a risk it can be. You can also get winter tetany, which is a, a similar issue on conserved feeds. Uh, average ranges for magnesium are 0.1 to 0 0.5. So you can see there is quite a range there. And if you're on the lower end of that range, then this tetany ratio might be something that, that should be looked at, depending what else is going on within, within your soil there. Uh, potassium, it, it's on most feed test. Deficiency is rare. If you sell a lot of hay, into, into the dairy industry for dry cow feed, they like to see low potassium numbers. And as Serena mentioned, there's, there's a huge range, 1% to 4% potassium. A lot of forages, especially grasses like orchard grass, they'll have a lot of luxury uptake of, of potassium. And that if it's available in the soil, they'll keep taking it up. They don't necessarily need it. And that'll be reflected in the feed test. Sulfur. Some feed tests within this were what I would consider borderline for a sulfur level. Uh, 
toxicity causes causes a lot of bad issues such as brainers and polio and cephalia. Uh, more importantly, sulfur can be antagonistic if there's too much of it to some of the micro minerals such as selenium and copper. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take take a little bit of an educated guess in that if if you're seeing a low sulfur feed test level, it's probably also low in your in your soil um, and uh, something that should probably be looked at with your uh, uh, agronomist in the, on that end of things. Microminerals, we had a question earlier on selenium and I know uh, Mike Malmberg mentioned uh, earlier to me that a lot of research was done in the uh, in the East Kootenays on selenium levels and uh, certainly it's a very common deficiency throughout the province. Um, the Okanagan's bad, the, the caribou has quite a few low areas, but there are some high spots. Uh, in, in my local area, we uh, had some producers from the caribou who said they had some high spots of selenium as well. And if you do have one of those spots, it's important you don't supplement extra selenium because there is a narrow range of tolerance for, uh, for livestock. And uh, yeah, if, if you're high, you don't want to put any more in. White muscle disease is the result of being deficient. Uh, anyone who's seen it knows that it's not a good situation. Um, before that, you usually start to see some retained placentas, cows that aren't cleaning properly. Uh, it also has a very critical relationship with vitamin E. I believe some of this research was done in the East Kootenays too with a, with a vet clinic uh, back in the 80s. And uh, a lot of minerals that were developed at, uh, at various times don't really reflect this relationship well enough, I feel. The vitamin E level is a little bit too low to, uh, to reflect the, the selenium level. And there is some complicated rules around, around the government in terms of how much selenium can be put into minerals. And that would be a, a whole different topic. Um, but if, if anyone has questions, we can, we can go into that um, later on. Uh, Selenium isn't reflected directly on these on these feed tests because it is a, a more expensive test to look for. Normally, if you're if you're deficient, it'll just show up as as ND not detected, which is basically zero. Okay, the other ones that are on this test uh, and are very common deficiencies as well in BC forages are copper. Uh, Eighty-five percent of these test results, when I look through them, actually are deficient in copper. Now, I would consider under 10 ppm, it's deficient. It's important for reproduction and breeding. There can be some uh, genetic differences between animals and their, and their tolerance for this. Sometimes you'll see dark colored cattle uh, with their hair going a little bit red tinge. That can be a reflection of copper. Uh, it can be antagonized by high sulfur or high molybdenum. So you can still have issues, even though you're sufficient in your forage test with copper, you can still have issues if say your water is really high in sulfur. Zinc is another one we talk about. It's very important for, uh, for feet, um, you know, dairies and feedlots. We're always, we're always talking about zinc in these cases, about keeping those feet healthy. Uh, but it's also important for immune response and growth. Now, 30 ppm is, is the number I'd like to see here or higher. And I think about 80% of the tests uh, for this study were actually deficient in zinc as well. Manganese, also on the feed test, it can have reduced fertility concerns, highly variable in forage levels. Uh, we saw that in this, in this results as well. Deficiency numbers somewhere around 40 ppm and uh, roughly, roughly half to 60% of the tests were deficient uh, in this study. Uh, I should mention too, I'm talking in, in ppm here. Some lab results will reflect this in, in a, a funny little backwards U that's that's the, the micro sign. It'll say U G or back, backwards U micrograms per gram. That is the same as ppm. Those are those are equivalent. Uh, other things that are some of these are on there. Iron is it's rarely deficient, but it's highly variable. I think we have between fifty and fifteen hundred on the feed test. I think there might have been an eighteen hundred, if that's right, Serena. Uh, sometimes this can be. It could be really high because that sample was contaminated by, uh, uh, it had a lot of soil in it, or uh, perhaps the sampling method was a little bit off. Uh, the probe actually had, had a little bit of wear on it and a little bit of, uh, a little bit of steel from the probe 
ended up in the soil or ended up, sorry, I say soil test, but ended up in the test. This can be, this can happen on soil tests as well. If you have a, a probe that's getting wore out or, or uh, is, is rusty and ends up, you know, slewing some of that off into your test, it can, it can be skewed and show up in the iron number. Uh, iodine, cobalt, and molybdenum, I won't, I won't get into those for the uh, efforts of time, but those are also micro minerals that sometimes show up on a, uh, on a feed test and uh, have impacts on the animal health and animal performance. Now, vitamins don't show up on a feed test, but I thought it was important to talk about them briefly. Uh, vitamin A comes from beta carotene in plants. It's high in leafy green forages, but lower in cereals and corn silage. It decreases with storage time and with maturity and with getting rained on, right? If, you, if your forage gets rained on, it's going to be lower in vitamin A again. So this might be something that, that needs to be supplemented depending on your forage quality. Vitamin D is typically met. We're not that concerned there. Uh, and vitamin E, I only bring it up because of its important relationship with, with selenium and uh, how that ties in with forages. Other measurements you might see on a forage test. Okay, nitrate levels. The key thing with nitrates is to pay close attention to how it's reported. Different labs do this differently. It can be as nitrate or nitrate nitrogen or potassium nitrate, and it could be as a percentage or as a PPM. And the, the numbers that are, uh, that are the tolerance numbers of how much you can feed at each of these is, is quite a bit different. So it's key to see how it is, uh, how it is reported and make sure you're looking at the right table in terms of whether that feed is safe to feed and at what percentage it can be feed, fed at. Now we've seen a lot more high nitrate levels this year, I'd, I'd say throughout the province because of the drought and uh, the lower, lower yields. Uh, nitrates are something that gets locked into the plant. Anytime it has a high stress, it, uh, it's been taking up nitrogen continuously and then it just gets shut off. So it could be a frost event or a, or a drought event and the nitrate gets trapped passed on into the feed and can cause issues such as such as nitrate poisoning which uh, usually results in death um, you'll see blue blood when you uh, when you cut, cut an animal open as a diagnostic uh, other results we might see is silage analysis uh, really important for any kind of ensiled feeds we'll look at ph we'll look at ammonia levels uh, we'll look at the uh, the percentages of the fermentation acids, lactic, acetic, propionic, and butyric. Um, some of these are really important. You know, ammonia that's that's too high can reflect a fermentation that went poorly with uh, with alfalfa, um, and can cause it can cause issues with um, uh, with that animal's energy requirements. Similar to feeding a feed that's that's uh, too high and soluble, uh, but pH that's too high can reflect a feed that that didn't ferment properly. Um, it you know, wasn't packed enough or had uh, had too much uh, oxygen come into it. Uh, and the fermentation analysis, it gives us similar information as well. Butyric being a, a key one here to look at because uh, uh, too much butyric acid can cause uh, all kinds of intake issues as well um, and generally reflects a fermentation that, that went sideways. Uh, we can also ask for specific uh, yeast and, and mold counts um, or uh, have a look at specific mycotoxins if a producer has some concerns around some, some mold or some uh, performance issues, some, some intake issues to see if there is something there. Uh, now, not, not all mold causes mycotoxins and, and not all uh, mycotoxins are at, at a level that's, that's toxic. Uh, I'll, I'll mention yeast a little bit too. We, see, we do see a lot of yeast on raft bales. Quite often that's the white fuzzy layer that can be right up, right up against the plastic. You know, not necessarily harmful, but uh, you know, at a, at a high amount, it can be uh, can be an issue too. So those those are other things you can look at in a forage test. Is uh, ask for counts on those. So when I'm looking at feed tests, first look, I'll look at the dry matter, make sure it's reflective of uh, of, of the test that I took and uh, the forage that uh, that we we're looking at. Have a look at the protein. A look at the fiber levels, ADF, NDF, how digestible that fiber is, NDFD. Uh, have a look at the, uh, the calculated values for energy, TDN or net energy. 
uh, but quite often I'll have a look at that RFQ number. I know a lot of hay is getting traded now on, on RFQ number, right? Producers will say, I'm, I, need a, I need a hay that's 150 or higher. I need a hay that's 180 or higher if you're selling into the dairy market. Um, or, or say, okay, I'm looking for a, a poorer quality. I want, I want 100 to 120. Uh, also look at the ash number because if that if that number is really high and you know quite often we'll have a discussion with the producer at this point if the ash is really high is the whole fee is the field really bad for for moles are you putting a lot of dirt in the feed you know did, did you ted it and run it right in the dirt um or is that the sample was there a sampling error that that was taken um and if that's the case, we, we may just resample it, right? And see if we get a different ash number because really high ash numbers will really throw all the other results off. We'll have a, a energy levels will be significantly lower, right? Cows don't milk or, or gain weight on dirt usually. Uh, we'll have a closer look at the protein, see what the soluble levels are like, have a closer look at starch and sugars, uh, maybe look at some of the digestibility numbers at different time periods, fermentation profiles, and of course, we'll look at minerals as well. Okay, that was a lot. Do I, I guess I should I should say if anyone has questions, type them into the chat as we go. <laughs> okay, we'll talk a bit about forage quality, uh, how to influence it, what drives it. Okay, stage of maturity is number one. Species and genetics also influences it. Uh, your environment and agronomic management drives it as well and of course harvest management so i'm sure many of you have seen graphs like this before this is for alfalfa quality versus growth stage so as you go uh, amount or quality is the is the up and down the y-axis and maturity as you go across the bottom right so yield goes up as we progress towards maturity total fiber goes up and fiber level on the test your adf ndf go up digestibility generally goes down as it matures and energy, uh, energy goes down accordingly, as well as protein. So once we get past full flower, you see a lot of things just kind of plateau and yield and, uh, and protein as well. So generally, I'm advising producers to cut somewhere between bud and full flower. Um, bud seems a little, a little bit early for a lot of producers requirements, but I know how our weather patterns can be can be so fickle, especially for dry hay producers. And uh, I like to have it have, have dry hay that's off and another shot at, uh, at making some hay um, on another cut uh, for you know, we, we have irrigation on most of our hay land. So that's an option. A grass compared to alfalfa grass general lower protein, more fiber, but more fiber digestibility. More of its energy comes from sugars. Alfalfa is very low sugar. It, it has that pectin instead in the cell walls. That's part of what makes alfalfa so hard to ferment. Is there's just not a lot of there's not a lot of sugar, not a lot of substrate. Um, you know, if you, if you do fermentation in your own house, you know you, that you need some energy there for the process to happen. Alfalfa doesn't have that readily available sugar in it. It, it has pectin instead in the cell walls. Uh, grass also loses quality a lot quicker than alfalfa. So. It's good to have alfalfa in a mix because it, it, it helps you push past those rainy periods without completely losing your quality that you would on a, on a straight grass stand. Um, these, are, these samples are from a different lab. I, I've done a few of these presentations, so I've stole some slides from, uh, from them. Um, protein comparison between a, uh, this is a straight alfalfa between full bloom and late bud. As you can see, we went from uh, about 10% protein at full bloom cut way earlier, late bud, 20% protein, okay? Now, interestingly, on this test, that ADICP, ADF protein that I mentioned earlier, um, it's at 14%. And I said, if it's over 10, it has had some heat damage. That was the case on, on this particular feed. Once we open these bales up, there was a little bit of caramelization in, in the middle of them. So even though it's reflected as a, a crude protein of 10 and a half, we actually should adjust that number down a little bit because of the portion that's bound up uh, from the heating. Now, fiber and energy comparison. Sorry, this might be blocked by your windows on the right there for uh, uh, everybody's little video there. But uh, you can see full bloom alfalfa, ADF is about 40, NDF about high 50s compared to cut early, 
28 and 36. Those are those are quite low. And energy values are are reflected similarly, right? TDN went from 55 to 65, relative feed quality of uh, just over 100, which we would consider kind of a, a lower quality feed um, to 176, which is which is quite a quite a good quality feed. Uh, you know, cutting date between these two feeds would have been about a month uh, for that. For they're they're both actually first cut feed, but about a month between them. I know there was some there was some cereal silages, so we'll talk about them briefly because they perform a little bit differently than uh, than your perennial alfalfa grasses in that uh, the energy goes down and then comes back up in terms of the energy that comes from the grain. So with cereal silages, we advise either to cut them early, right at boot stage, as the heads are emerging or just before, or to let them go out to, to a soft dough stage to capture that energy out of the cereal. Uh, kind of that middle is where you're giving up yield and quality, so we don't really want to be there. Other influences on quality, as I mentioned, there can be differences between species within, within grasses, especially with digestibility and how those bonds are, are made between the lignin and the hemicellulose. And uh, that's reflected in the, uh, in the fiber digestibility numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. There also can be differences between varieties in this. Um, we'll see this uh, somewhat on alfalfa and uh, quite top to bottom, there might be a eight to 10% difference in, uh, in quality. Hopefully I'm not breaking up here too bad. I see it said my quality is unstable or my connection is unstable. Uh, environment also drives this and, and this is to BC's advantage. I know the caribou, we saw a lot of this. Uh, long days and cool nights are better for forage quality. Warm, wet weather is a, is a negative for forage quality. And this has to do with, with how the plant moves sugars about and, uh, and, and the photosynthesis process. Also ties into sunlight, more sunlight, bright sunny days, long, long days, and cool nights. What well, you need to grow excellent quality forage. <laughs> uh, agronomically, you need to have adequate fertility, you need to have adequate stand density, uh, free of pests, disease, weeds. I have a couple images here. Uh, that's a severely boron deficient alfalfa plant. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot poor feed quality out of that than there is out of a healthy one. And on the right, that is a, uh, a barley stand that has a stripe rust issue. As you can see, the, the leaves are starting to come off of it. It's not able to put energy into the, into the grain properly. And uh, that'll also test quite poorly as a, as a forage quality standpoint. Harvest management influences. We'd like to have rapid curing uh, because the longer it takes to dry down is a negative to forage quality until respiration stops. So. Generally, we like, we like to advise to lay, uh, lay your windrows out as wide as possible. Use a tether in some cases. Don't run it in the dirt and put lots of ash in there or, or knock all the leaves off. Uh, leaf loss is another negative, both at breaking, baling, tedding. Uh, rain leaching, of course, is, is a negative. Generally, forage quality is higher in, in the evenings. There's a diurnal variation. But this isn't necessarily always reflected in a feed test because in our climates that uh, uh, generally we, we get a, a dew at night in a lot of the province and dry down stops or, or close to, you reach a humidity level where dry down stops. So respiration is continuing. So generally sometimes cutting in the evening isn't necessarily as beneficial as some of the, uh, some of the published data would, would reflect from drier climates, but very farm specific. Uh, and I, I mentioned. I jump in when you're saying that you're yep. variation. Are you referring to um, the cutting time? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Refer, referring to cutting time of uh, morning versus nighttime. Sorry. So generally, cutting at nighttime gives you a little bit higher quality, a little bit higher sugar levels because the plant has been able to photosynthesize all day, build those sugar levels up, and then the nighttime dark reactions. If if you had to take. Uh, uh, biology back in school uh, happen, which which use some of that sugar up to to uh, fund plant growth, basically. Um, now, storage is also important on forage or forage quality. Right? Is it 
out of the weather? Is it the correct moisture? Is it heating up in the in the barn? Um, then on silage, optimum moisture for crop and uh, and type of crop, whether it be bunker bags, bales, uh, excluding oxygen, have the proper chop length, packing, uh, the proper the proper covers on there, and uh, and then putting an inoculant on it is is something that's quite important, especially with crops like alfalfa, and uh, uh, you know generally there's there's a pretty good return to doing that. Um, there, I should mention there also is some inoculants out there that will uh, actually have bacteria in there that work within the silage to break bonds um, within the lignin and hemicellulose mat matrix. So there's, there's some pretty neat technology out there uh, that's maybe not utilized everywhere. Now, a little bit about feeding management. Mul there's multiple rations on every farm, right? Uh, the nutritionist can come in and formulate a ration, but is that what's actually getting fed? And that's where the dry matter plays into it so much, especially with, with wet crops. Is, it, is, is what you're measuring off in there actually reflective to the numbers that you got back on the, in the feed test originally, uh, or has your moisture changed? And then of course, what's consumed? What are the refusals? What are the waste? Um, you know, we have, a, we have a predicted intake for cattle and we can, we can estimate what that was. And how well does that match up to what your actual feed disappearance is? How much feed you're delivering out to the animals? Uh, maybe able to estimate a bit of a bit of a wastage factor in there, whether it's five percent. I mean, it might be twenty percent for for some producers uh, feeding something ground fine on the ground. Uh, so, say things to monitor: moisture content, refusals, um, how well they're cleaning up, and uh, and then we also always like to look at the manure if we can see if there's anything passing through or um, how, well it, how well it stacks up is really a good representation of what the protein balance of that, uh, of that animal's diet is. Okay, I'm gonna touch on some strategies for feeding briefly, because I had some questions about this um, beforehand. So first thing to do always is feed test, and, and we're here because of that, so that's great. <laughs> uh, now, what do I do, right? I'm going to be short feed and feed's expensive. What are some, what are some things we can look at? And I'm just going to go over these, over these briefly, right? Um, we can change the demand, uh, group by needs. That's, that's the biggest one for me, right? Your, your heifers have a different requirement from mature cows. Uh, the two-year-olds can sometimes be pushed into the heifers if they're a little bit thin. Um, or sorry, the second, second calvers. Uh, you know, bulls are already off separate. Uh, you know, depending on your calving date, you can look at early weaning. Uh, we mentioned earlier how cold weather can affect cattle. So wind all, also affects them. They could, they could feel the wind chill. So you have proper wind breaks, proper protection from the wind. Uh, mud can also affect, you know, affect uh, their ability to get, get to feed and their performance on feed, the amount of energy that they're burning, moving around. Uh, so anything we can do there to change the demand is important. Anything we do to improve efficiency, looking at those waste numbers, how we're feeding it, uh, how we're processing the feed that's going in. If you're feeding some really coarse straw and uh, you know it, it's extremely coarse, depending on the class of livestock, sometimes chopping that finer can help improve the efficiency of the use of that straw. Uh, also ionophores are, are quite important. This is, this is rumensin. Uh, you know, a number of studies have shown uh, a decrease in feed usage for mature cows fed rumensin between five and eight uh, percent. Say that's uh, if you have an ability to, to feed it, that one's a pretty low hanging fruit for me. And you could and you could tolerate the other negatives. Um, you know, keeping it away from uh, uh, from horses and dogs. Uh, and then it's also important to cost compare your different supplementation strategies, looking at your cost per pound of protein or cost per pound of TDM is one good way to do this. Uh, herd management, uh, you know, cull opens. I know, I know there's some smaller producers that, that don't necessarily preg chap, so they'll carry those animals through. You know, if you're, if you're short feed, that's a, that's a cost. Uh, maybe consider some purchase, purchase replacements that year. Uh, Ship, ship the uh, ship your own ones, uh, especially a year like this. You have to consider the costs of uh, of developing your replacements with high quality forage compared to you know, a year where 
Um, perhaps, perhaps they might be priced a little bit more economically. Uh, feeding management, we could look at things like selling some of your hay and purchasing in some higher quality. Uh, I found that in years where feed prices are high, the difference between say a dairy quality hay and a, and a low quality hay isn't that much, right? It might only be 75 or hundred dollars a ton. Whereas in a year where there's ample low quality hay around that dairy hay still takes a premium price. So sometimes we can take, we can take advantage of that if you're a little bit short. Um, you can look at alternate day feeding. If you are bringing in a higher quality feed uh, rather than feeding both at the same time, there's a lot of research that has been done that shows you can feed the low quality hay one day and feed a, feed a high quality hay the next day and, and get to the same spot or, or even low quality day for two days and a high quality day for the third day. Um, so all depends on what's exactly on farm. Can also look at limiting, limiting their intake um, either by quantity or, or by time, excluding them out of your feeding area uh, to drop that. And this is something that's possibly under underutilized in, uh, in the province, um, especially if producers have really high quality forage. You have to have a pretty high level of management for it though, because you need enough bunk space that they're not gonna fight and you have to get used to them sounding like they're hungry, but, but they're not. The key is to make sure that you're supplying all of the nutrients that they require. We're just not necessarily meeting their full interest in eating, right? Um, you know, if I, if I go buy a pizza, I can probably sit down and eat the whole thing, but I don't necessarily need to do that. And similar to, to what we're doing here with limit feeding. Uh, don't forget minerals, especially if you're bringing in other products such as straw or, uh, or byproducts because uh, of the important importance of calcium that I mentioned there, calcium and phosphorus, and also some of those micros. And monitor the results on your own farm and keep records. See how well it's working. And I just mentioned kind of some long-term strategies to build resili resiliency for your operation around forage quality and around um, yeah, man managing. So look to changing demand. Maybe if you're always making really good hay, maybe look at moving moving a calving day, maybe look at some fall calving, move those high nutrient needs into a, into a spot where, where you have the forage quality to back it up. Um, maybe look at changing your weaning dates. Uh, I know some producers who extend grazing and are concerned about their, their cattle getting too fat on, high, on really high quality extended grazing, leaving the calves on them to increase that demand for, for the cow, right? The calf's still pulling some milk, so it can help offset that extra nutritional value in that extended grazing product. Uh, if you have a lot of really good feed, maybe look more at background. Right? I know some producers on this call do some feeding. That's that's great. Uh, I've heard genetics. I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but I know a lot of producers have opinions on different demands uh, from genetics and cow size and matching that to your environment. Uh, say, consider different crop rotations, extending grazing fall and spring. I mentioned this as well as a plug for the Forage Council and a lot of the research that's going on and going to be going on in this area. Uh, also look at maybe ways to do higher yield or higher quality around different species, different varieties, different blends, um, increase the carrying capacity of your, of your operation and how that can match. Okay, so in summary, forage quality is really important. We need to consider the use of the feed. Energy is just, important, just as important as protein. Everybody wants to talk about protein first, but we really need to talk about energy too. Fiber and digestibility drive intake. Um, we like to use RFQ to compare because it, it, uh, it's kind of cross species applicable and we'll manage for high quality. Uh, this, this is kind of my, my key, right? We're always, it's always a lot more fun to try to make high quality feed and then gives you more options to manage if you're short and need to bring in some lower quality. And there's my contact info for anyone with uh, further questions, I guess. I think we had some in the chat. I did have, I do have some other slides with some cost stuff if. Uh, yeah, well, let's open the floor, Mike. Thank you so yeah. much for that uh, whirlwind. Of it was, it was a lot. <laughs> um, you did a fantastic job, thank you. And 
I wouldn't be surprised if some producers have questions specific to their forage test results. So if anybody wants to ask specific questions about anomalies on their tests or, or what a specific number means, by all means, uh, you can unmute or you can put it in the chat um, or questions that might not even be related to your test, but just alternate feeding patterns or anything. So go ahead. Hey, uh, Mike, this is Doug Foss and I'm over in Rock Creek. Um, I didn't send in any of my samples to uh, this deal, but it just, it was interesting. I did a, a silage sample of alfalfa and grass this year and it, my butyric acid was uh, 7.43, which is supposedly really, really high. And on that one, the ash was 13.5. But it was, it was an interesting sample because I wasn't very far into the silage pit. And it kind of goes with your, like, doing it at the right spot in your silage pit. And I think what happened was it was a chunk that had been pushed up off the dirt floor of our silage pit about three or four times and added quite a bit of dirt into that sample. But I, I, I think that's an interesting thing when we do samples is to look really closely where that sample came from and try to do it for your whole area. Um, but it was just an interesting result that I got. That was a little, like if you fed that, if all your alfalfa silage was that high, it'd be a real big problem. But because it's just a, a sample, I learned something from it. <laughs> for sure, that, that's great, Doug. Yeah, yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing that. 7.2, that's, that's really high. We had a, a bit of a wreck over here last year with some feed, a lot of feed that got put up too wet the year before year before this past year. And I know some some dairy producers where where the cows are extremely sensitive to butyric acid and ended up spreading their entire silage bunks back on the field because they were too high in butyric to feed uh, safely. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Doug, because um, I had a question from another producer about why his ash levels were so high. And it was interesting just listening to your presentation, Mike, and talking about issues with voles, things that I hadn't necessarily considered. So thanks for touching on that. Um, I also had a question from another producer that came by email, which was about um, the high iron levels. Like, it seems really variable in our region. Can you speak to that? For sure, for sure. And I, um, and initially I, I go back to the sample and I just, I'd, I'd rule out that it wasn't, you know, if, if what was it the same probe that, that did those samples as did other samples that were, that were lower, uh, just, yeah, just to reflect that. And then where the ash number is, if that's, if that's also very high or, or not, um, yeah, those, those would, those would be the key ones. Now animals can tolerate a quite a bit of iron so it's not necessarily a, a bad thing i mean iron is an important nutrient for uh for us but it can just be an indicator that maybe the rest of the sample isn't reflective as well okay thank you and i'll just keep going <laughs> the question sure. about nitrates um and i didn't notice is i'm just curious like across bc were nitrate levels an issue with the drought we experienced this year? Uh, yes, definitely. We had more samples. I know locally here, there was more producers with, with questions and, and we had some uh, up in the caribou as well uh, with, with high nitrate levels. Now, typically every, every year we'll get a, a few questions and usually it's a producer who had uh, a long history of applying a lot of manure to that area or um, uh, perhaps was growing crops that are have a higher susceptibility to it regularly, which is, uh, uh, you know, cereal crops and some annual grasses, your rye grasses. Uh, but this, this year we, we certainly saw a lot more, a lot more of that from the drought. Uh, it's also, I guess, an indication because more producers, you know, may have, may have bailed up feeding areas and other areas like that, that they wouldn't necessarily have otherwise if they, uh, had enough feed. Okay, thank you. So, and, so, and some weeds in those areas can really accumulate nitrates too. Uh, 
I had a question about a, inoculants, uh, Mike. You mentioned how useful they are, but often it, they're they're difficult to find here. They, they're tough to get across the border. There's special kinds for certain varieties. Could you could you expand on that for me? For sure, for sure. So Canada uh, has pretty stringent rules around around uh, inoculants because like in Canada they have to prove efficacy that they, they have to prove that they work uh, to the to the CFIA. So some products that are available in the states aren't necessarily available here if either they don't work or uh, the, the provider doesn't feel that we're a large enough market to to bring it up to. Um, luckily, I would say a lot of them are starting to come in the, gr the small granular powders where you don't need a lot of product to, uh, to apply. And uh, most, uh, most kind of seed suppliers or forage input suppliers have, have a line that they, that they can offer. Um, say more, it's, it's much more common within the dairy industry, I would say. Um, I saw some data that showed probably 50, 60% plus of crops are, are inoculated now or silage crops are inoculated um, within, within that industry. Um, and there's different, I, I, okay, I'll back up a little bit more and say there's kind of three different levels to an inoculant. There's kind of a general um, help fermentation drop pH faster inoculant, which usually results in better dry matter recovery. Then there's kind of a secondary inoculant which has some Buchneri bacteria within it and what that Buchneri does is is prevent heating at, at feed out it helps with the aerobic stability of the feed and uh, there, there's a number of different products of, of both of those out there and then the, the third level would be uh, you know the stuff that has bacteria to actually change feed quality uh, and they're they're a little bit less common for sure and, and more expensive. Hey Mike, uh, Trevor Hand here from Briscoe. Um, fantastic presentation and uh, I think a really great attempt to, uh, to try to dumb down a pretty complex um, topic. Question for you though, and maybe I missed it. So if I did, sorry. Talk about sugar and the question related to cutting later in the day uh, may result in, in higher sugar content. Where on our lab analysis would I see a, a number that relates directly to sugar? Probably on the second page on that one, yeah. I think there's an ES, ESC number. Um, ESC, sample sugar, yeah, you betcha. Yeah. And so eight is one of my as fed numbers? The eight would be fairly average. Eight would be fairly average, yeah. yeah. I would say on, an, on a straight ESC number, it's going to be lower than a WSC number that you may see on other tests. And over, say, a dozen or over over 12 on WSC. So over probably over 10 on ESC would be considered a fairly high sugar. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Mike, if you want, I could reshare that sugar comparison of across the different categories. Sure. I'll hit, I'll hit stop here. Freedom, there was a question in the chat about how it's a participant who didn't submit forage quality samples, but is interested in the data. So Serena, would we be able to share out the table of all the data from across the region because they're numerically coded, right? Yeah, I don't see any problem why we shouldn't be able to provide that link out. I think there might be one or two more things that I would like to add to that document just to contextualize it to make it historically relevant. Um, but yeah, because it's all the, all the data is coded, I don't see a problem with sharing that because it'd be pretty hard to link it back to who it came from. Okay, great. So as a follow-up to this event today, we'll send out a package to all the participants who registered for this event that'll have this event recording, maybe the PowerPoint presentation and that table of data. Um, so everybody will get that package probably in about four to five days. It takes us a couple of days to process the video and put it in YouTube and do all that kind of fun stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, just um, on the note of, so it sounded like that one specific sample was around 8%, which you can see is um, 
pretty close to the average that we are seeing for um, across the different uh, haze and green feeds. Um, it did go down a little bit, but very quite a bit, um, I would say with the silages. Um, but even within the hay samples, we saw that at least one sample that was getting up to 14% sugar. So maybe Mike, if you kind of want to, what kind of make a reference to what a 14% sugar hay would look, would, would mean. Yeah, so that, that, is, that is a fairly high sugar hay at, at 14 for sure. Um, I think it's also, you know, you mentioned that the silage samples were lower and that's reflected because they went through the silage process and that some of the sugars are consumed during, uh, during and siling um, and, and turned into those other uh, fermented acids that we could ask for on a, on a silage test result. Uh, you can see also the, the hay legume over 50%, so the stuff's predominantly alfalfa, is, is a little bit lower sugar. I think they all probably had some grass in it, um, but generally alfalfa will show that lower sugar test on here because it's, it's mostly pectin and that's not always reflected. Uh, what else did I say about this one? Warm season annuals are, gener are generally high in sugar. That's one of the main reasons they get good energy. So that's, that's probably a lower sugar level for a warm season annual. I, I would expect that to be higher commonly. Okay, that one was si uh, silage, just as a reference, that one was. Okay. Just to expand on the sugar, and, and thanks for diving into it a little bit for me. Uh, just my numbers, exact same field, first cut versus uh, second cut. Yeah, my first cut numbers were 8%. My second cut numbers were 12.2%. Um, so pretty darn interesting and uh, really neat to see the, the numbers and, and how the feed quality can, can change. So, so yeah, really appreciate it. The, the effort to, to make all this happen. Hi, Mike. Uh, I got another question here <clears throat> from earlier. Just comparing warm season and cool season annuals, if you've got some examples of what the major warm and cool season annuals that get used around here are, and what are some of the big differences between them? Okay, wow, thank you. That's a good question. <laughs> uh, so cool season annuals are pretty much all the perennials that we commonly grow. Orchard grass, brome grass, wheat grass. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw rye grasses in there as well because they are, uh, they're mostly grown as an annual for us, either Italian or, uh, or a true annual like a Westerwold. Uh, alfalfa is middle of the road. It, it likes the heat as much as a, uh, uh, as, as much as some of the warm seasons do. So we'll call off alpha middle. I know you just asked about annuals, but I'm throwing perennials in here too. <laughs> Other cool season annuals, uh, all of our cereal crops, uh, wheat, barley, oats, whether it's winter cereal or spring seeded cereal, either way. Um, and warm seasons that we commonly see the big, big ones, corn, um, also see some sorghum sedan, or straight Sudan grass, straight sorghum. There's some forage options in, in all three of those. Uh, we'll see like millets, uh, golden German, red prozo, uh, Japanese millet. Seen some uh, Persian millet as well lately that, that seems to have some forage utility. Uh, warm seasons don't like temperatures under 10 degrees very much is, is the best way to put it. At uh, you need warm soil temperatures, the more heat, the better. This year, it was it was amazing some of the yield that we're able to get off of uh, off of warm seasons. So quite often in our area, uh, they're they're a really good fit after a winter cereal crop comes off as silage. We'll come in with the warm season annuals and plant them. Great, thanks, Mike. We do have another question in the chat from Patricia asking if there's an information sheet or a fact sheet available that lists the average of all the qualities of a good alfalfa hay and grass alfalfa hay mix. So I think you sort of touched on some graphs, but uh, where's a good central landing place where we can find those averages and fact sheets? It's a little bit complicated because um, what we would consider a good alfalfa for, for a dry cow or for a uh, uh, a lactating cow can be a, a, you know, a little bit different, right? And what we would consider 
a good alfalfa for someone who's using it within a feedlot setting is, is going to be a, a different number as well. So uh, just, just to say kind of general shooting from the hip for a cow calf producer, I'd like to see forages somewhere between 12 and 14% crude protein with an alfalfa grass mix, um, ADF levels in mid thirties generally. And, and it should get you a relative feed quality number between 120 and 140 that that kind of range should be useful for most most of what you're doing and not be short now if you are backgrounding animals there can certainly be utility in having in having a higher quality forage you're going to end up overfeeding protein but the to, in order to get the energy to get the performance um it'd be better to have to be up in that 150 relative feed value number for uh, for some of it I hope that helps a bit. <laughs> Great, thanks. And it's a good question from Patricia. I feel like I could do a bit of digging and there might be some tables somewhere that exist out there from the Ministry of Agriculture or something that have those different ranges for different uh, stock or, or what animal you're trying to grow and, and breed. So thanks, Patricia. It's a good question. One, um, one place that I would... I kind of have dived into as well as the Beef Cattle Research Council, BCRC. So if you don't follow them on Facebook or uh, I, I don't know if they're on Instagram, I, um, I get their newsletter and I get follow them on Facebook, but they often do a lot of pretty relevant for the cattle industry. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an equivalent for uh, sheep production. I'm sure, I'm sure there are, but uh, BCRC is pretty prevalent and they're pretty good with the extension component. So I would recommend that. There's also a, a really good publication by the Alberta Ministry of Agriculture, a, a beef, beef cow calf production manual. And it's, it's a couple inches thick coil back and, and that has a, a mountain of information in it um, for cow calf producers on, on a number of topics. Perfect, two really good resources. I'll send those out in our, when I send out the package to everybody who registered today. Cause as Patricia said, it's, it's hard to remember the, the numbers being floated about. It's nice to have you know, on the inside of your barn wall, a little, a little sticker up there. <laughs> she gives a thumbs up. Um, did you, so we're at 12 o'clock and did you want to attempt tackling that economic portion, Mike? It, it, you know, if folks have to go, it's, it's okay. This is being recorded, but economics are so important. So if you feel like you have the time and, and the breath, we would welcome you to dive in there. But if you want to do a part two, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you speak to that. Yeah, I do, I, do have, I do have a bit there if producers are interested kind of in helping them compare um, different, different feeds or different supplementation strategies. Um, Let's do it. Okay, okay. I did see one other question quickly pop up on chat there about, it came up quick about acetic acid, I think. Yeah, lots of talk about acids and ferments. What about acetic acid? Okay. Okay. So, so generally, high high acetic acid is is a good thing uh, on a on a feed test. That means that fermentation went went quite well. Okay. I'll go back to share screen here. There's a follow up question there, Mike. Oh, can okay. Can, can you add it? I'm assuming can you add the acetic acid into the mix or something along those lines? Okay. No. I'll I'll, I'll back up a little bit on on nutrition. Um, from a standpoint then and that and that these acids that we're talking about are something that's naturally produced within uh, within a cow as well um, it's what's produced within the rumen and uh, we talk about it in, in in silage because it has certain indications in there but as we feed as we feed forage to to cattle they'll break down those sugars and those um uh fermentable carbohydrates into uh, into the various acids of acetic propionic and uh, I'm missing one, not, but not butyric, but <laughs> uh, anyway, acetic is used quite efficiently within the animal. And so it isn't necessarily something that we would, we would feed directly, but it's something that, uh, you know, by, by feeding energy to the animal, they'll produce for us. That helps clarify it for me. I'm still still learning all these pieces <laughs> okay I, I mentioned 
Uh, cost of feeding and comparing ingredients by energy cost and, and by TDN is something that we can do off, off a feed test, right? So if you're looking at buying a lot of hay, it's helpful to have that feed test, convert it to dry matter. Uh, in this case, I use TDN. I pulled some cost of per ton numbers that are, uh, I don't know if they're entirely reflective, but they're, they're some local numbers. They may be a little bit low on hay at this point. And uh, I, I don't even know if there's any screenings available. So that number might be a little bit off as well. Um, so what I did is I converted, converted to dry matter and then went to a, to a cost per pound for that feed. So for example, premium alfalfa hay at $350 a, a ton. And um, in, in our area, hay is usually traded by the, by the US ton, the 2000 pound ton. So that's important to note in these math calculations. Uh, so it comes out to 20 cents a pound and uh, that per dry basis, right? So we, we took the water out of it. So I can, I can help people with that math further on or there's other resources we can, we can find online to help, help calculate. So I think BCRC might even have a calculator for this on their webpage. Uh, then we multiply that or divide it by the percent TDN to get the cost per pound of TDN. So I find this really useful as a way to compare different different ingredients, right? We can see the cheapest feed per pound of TDN is corn silage, if, if you can find any for sale, which is probably not traded as much in, in, uh, in the Kootenays as it is, as it is locally here. Uh, you know, screenings, if they're available, could be, could be an attractive energy supplement. Um, but it's, it's interesting that currently premium alfalfa hay is about the same cost as bringing in grain to, to our and from a strictly from an energy standpoint, we can do something similar on protein. Look at say a, a molasses tub that's twenty five percent protein, or supplementing with uh, with peas with distillers grains. Um, now the distillers grains in this case is this is something from uh, say an ethanol plant, um, rather rather than say a small scale uh, brewery or distillery. So a little, little bit different product. Um, or using canola meal, which is very common. I've got the alfalfa hay in here as well, or, uh, or urea, which is commonly used in supplements as well. Um, so I, I do like to compare protein costs in this way. Um, those molasses tubs seem to creep up quite often as being a very expensive way to supplement protein. So I ran some kind of examples here. If, you, if a producer has poor quality hay, uh, grass hay, 8% protein, low 50s TDN. I'm just going to value that at 275 a ton. It's it's high for a normal year, right? Normally, we'd probably say that's worth 100 and a quarter or 150 a ton um, in in our region. Cows are in good conditions. We're not looking to do anything different there. Uh, it's currently mid January. I put that in here as well. Coming to calve in mid February. Turnouts the first of May. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this rancher has some, uh, some, some tame pasture of their own before, before going on to range. I realize range turnouts probably later than that. Uh, second trimester nutrition needs are met. Third trimester, what we're in here, we got about 30 days left. We're borderline short on protein and energy. Certainly, uh, certainly energy. And after calving, we're short on both. And I, I have that as about 75 days on feed. So what I did, and you'll have to, uh, hit the little button on top there if everybody's little pictures in the way to make it smaller. Um, if the producer did nothing, this is a feed cost per head per day for both for third trimester and for after calving. And then what the difference would be on a per cow basis by making different decisions. The so three different decisions I came up with were purchasing high quality hay in, purchasing a supplement, or purchasing some high quality grain, a hay, plus feeding a bit of grain. So I, I like to run these different scenarios as different ways to do and see how it affects your feed cost per head per day. It does take some work um, from a ration balancing standpoint to, to make it happen, but it can be a pretty useful tool because, you know, as you can see, we're between 60 and 70 bucks uh, of an increase in marginal cost as compared to, to doing nothing. So spending a fair bit of money to get that extra performance. Um, and depending on the price of inputs at your location, it can change. It can change quite a bit too. The complete opposite would be a producer has excellent quality hay, 
say at almost 20% protein over 60 TDM, we're going to value that like it's 350 a ton. Same scenario for calving date and turnout date, but there's a high opportunity cost, right? There's a, there's a high cost of feeding this hay to your, within your cow-calf operation. It could be useful somewhere else or, or have higher value somewhere else. So by doing nothing, it's costing us, you know, around 430 to 480 per head per day. I don't have any yardage in here. This is strictly feed cost at market values. Okay. And I know some people don't necessarily want to talk about market values. Like, well, it didn't cost me that to produce it. I'll get to that a little bit further on, but um, market value is reflected in these examples because if we're buying any product in, we have to pay market value to do that. So if you're to purchase straw and maybe sell off some of that higher quality hay that you have, we could save about 30 bucks a cow, okay? If we were to bring in, uh, bring in straw for after calving and use some limit feeding techniques up to calving, I don't really like limiting intake after calving. There can be some issues around that. We could get that savings up to about $45 a head. Uh, conversely, say a producer can't find any straw or doesn't want to deal with it and is just able to find some poorer quality hay, something in that better meets the needs, 14% protein, 15% protein. And uh, we could sell some of the high quality off, mix it along with, with the purchased hay, it would probably save about 30 bucks a head. So uh, they're kind of all, all tools that, um, that a producer could consider if you make feed that's too high of quality, too high quality for those cows. Another example is a producer short hay. Um, I just came up with looking for about 50 tons short and would like to mix it in with their current hay is able to source the following feed. And I've got a few things at different prices there. Um, you say I'm not, these, these aren't actual, uh, actual quotes that I got. They're just kind of approximated values. And each of these was, was meant to feed along with, uh, with an existing, with your existing hay. And I did this one a little bit differently. I just kind of formulated them to get similar to the hay that you already have at, uh, you're, you just don't have enough of it. So you can mix in some high quality hay with some poor hay. That was actually one of the most cost-effective methods or other examples such as bringing in straw along with some, uh, some corn and using a bit of a supplement to, buy, to provide protein that came in as a fairly expensive option, right? But all told, I mean, we're what, about $2,500, not even that, $2,200 between the different options. So it's, it, it's relevant, right? Just 10, 15% difference uh, cost between different options, depending on what's available. This is, this is my last example. And this is kind of longer, longer picture planning kind of stuff. Uh, producer wants to compare different production systems, uh, cereals versus corn silage, and, and maybe incorporating some of the limit feeding into their operation. I'm going to assume that the producer has that good quality hay, that 14% protein, 57 TDN. Now, in this example, I decided to use uh, the producer's cost of production numbers. I just pretended the producers gave me their cost of productions. They said, okay, it costs us $140 a ton to put up our hay. And we feel that we can put up alfalfa silage, corn silage, and cereal silage for those numbers. And these are on an as-fed basis rather than a dry matter basis. Um, you know, and, and they assume, a, I would say, a, an average level of moisture for each of those silages. Now, and this is based over the whole winter, 165-day feeding period. 90 days of it is, say, third, third trimester, um, November 15th to February 15th. 75 days of it is after calving, February 15th to May 1st. Um, I'm assuming that, that up until November 15th, the producer has some other, uh, some other feed available. And remember, these numbers are cost, whereas the other ones were market value. These ones are, are producer's cost. Uh, so feeding their good quality hay, looking between $1.80 and $2.10 a head a day in feed cost. Uh, if we were to incorporate some cereal silage into that ration, we could knock about 30 bucks a head out of there for the whole season. Um, if once we bring corn silage in, and this, this is why I really like corn silage is it gives us 
is energy density gives us a lot of options to do other things. So corn silage plus cereal silage plus some purchased straw at about $200 a ton. They were in, we're in a similar spot to where we'd be with just cereal silage. But if we look at uh, doing some limit feeding while those calves are still pregnant and then increasing the amount of hay after calving, we could see a marginal savings of about $60 a head. So those, I don't know, some, some numbers to uh, kind of process and look at in the big picture of an operation. And, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do these calculations without doing the, without doing the feed tests and uh, to, to build off of them. Yeah, it's really fascinating, Mike, just to under, to contextualize how we can continue to use these quality numbers to inform our economics of the farm. And so thank you for running through that. Mike, I, Mike Malberg, I know you've done a lot of business and analysis around beef cattle operations. Do you have any comments? Feel, feel free to pick on it. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Mike. That uh, those cost analysis are great, great things, and uh, really the bottom line—that's what it's all about, in my opinion. Uh, and quite often, it means survival uh, in the short term, and uh, maybe survival in the long term too. So it's really important to do those kinds of things in our area. I'm not so sure that uh, there's not very much corn silage grown for a number of reasons. Um, we don't really have the heat units for uh, that we that we should be having versus uh, the Okanagan, but there are certainly other alternatives to look at, and I think it's really important to do that kind of um, that kind of analysis because that's a big part of the value of feed testing. <clears throat> a lot of times, people. They, they, they've got a pile of hay there and that's what they've got. They have to do something with it. Uh, it's very difficult to trade it, uh, you know, to, to, to sell it and, and buy some other product. We don't have those kinds of options in this area, area as, uh, as might happen in some other areas. So we're pretty much stuck with what we've grown for at least that year. But we may do something in in future years to to balance that off. And uh, the analysis that you showed earlier on looking at what can we do if we're short of hay, or if we uh, if we need to buy if we've got poor quality hay, we need to supplement it with something. It's really critical and important to do those kinds of calculations. And the uh, the figures that you showed us there you know, point that out and, uh, you know, savings of $30 a cow on a 200 cow herd can, uh, can quickly uh, be a very significant part of your net farm income. Well done. Thanks, I, I just added, yeah, I just added a few notes for the folks who are interested in what the feed costs actually are. I kind of give an outline of some, breaking down the, the actually pretty pretty affordable <laughs> uh, tests. If you think about how much information uh, it would be able to provide you in, in for planning, so I added those to the chat just for a reference point. Mm, okay. Well, thanks, Serena, and thanks, Mike and Mike. And I a lot of these cost comparisons can be tricky, but I want to just put the shout out there that Mike. Mike and Mike are both available to help producers with specific questions after this event today. So should you have additional questions to troubleshoot how you're gonna get through the winter, for example, um, consider KBFA and Mike and Mike and Serena resources for that. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? I, I know we've, we're almost at two and a half hours here. So we've dropped down to 14 participants and I think, you know, as painful as Zoom can be in terms of being remote, it's so nice because we do have these recordings that people can reference later. Okay, if we don't have any more questions from the, the audience, I would just like to extend so much gratitude and thank you to uh, Mike and Serena for helping put this event together. And we'll be sending out all the recordings and resources later on. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out.